God, I hate it when that happens. I, <laughs> I really hate that. We've got sound now. I can tell that we've got sound now. There's so many things to get wrong when you do this. You know, anything live, if it can possibly go wrong, and I mean in a radio studio, you've got, you wear the headphones, you've got a producer who's in the intercom in the ear every time you make a mistake. So there's all of that stuff. Anyway, I'm with you now and hopefully you can hear me. Please let me know if you can't. And we'll get back into this. Now, what is it now? I did say 2.30 and I've detained you. I've wasted 11, nearly 12 minutes of your life pantomiming me talking to you about some shit that's important or other. And now we can do it for real. So isn't that uplifting? Anywho, what I want to talk to you about today, okay, is... This whole business, and I've seen a few people fall into this trap. There's, there's been two in the past week, and a few other people have sort of stood on the precipice of making this mistake. And I've kind of said, hey, did you know this? And they've kind of backed out of the deal at 100 miles an hour. So put yourself in this position, all right? How would you feel if you were looking for a car? You want to buy a reasonably affordable mainstream car. You haven't got all that much money to spend in the context of buying a car, okay? And you jump for, let's say, a Suzuki Swift Sport or a Toyota CHR, and you think, yes, good Japanese brands, fantastic, and you bring it home, you drive it around for a couple of days, and all of a sudden, you need to refill your shiny new car. So, if you do that and then you turn up at the servo and you open the fuel filler flap, um, wouldn't you be a little miffed if, you know, it swings open like this in slow-mo, like an action scene from a movie, like that, and you see the words, premium, unleaded, only. That would piss me off if I was unaware because you know that for the duration of owning that car, or you should know for the duration of owning that car, that you are going to need to fill it with expensive fuel. And you've bought it perhaps on its reputation for not consuming very much fuel. You've bought it because it was an affordable purchase in the first place. And now you've got to tip this expensive fuel in it. Just so we're all on the same page here. In Australia, we use this thing called the RON rating, the Research Octane Number. And there are four different flavours of fuel. There's E10, which is kind of a substitute for number two, which is 91. E10's got a slightly higher octane rating than 91, but I can't tell you exactly what it is because the, the 10 in the E10 stands for up to 10% ethanol. So the minimum octane rating of E10 is 91, but it could be as high as 93 or something. And then there's 95, so there's that. And then there's 98, and they're typically reserved for higher performance cars because you can tune an engine up by increasing the compression ratio to uh, perform in a better way if the fuel is more tolerant of high compression than, say, 91 or E10. And that's why 95 and 98 exist. And you, it leads to problems like this, okay? Like, let's say you're Toyota or you're Suzuki and you make a vehicle that you think you're going to do a lot of selling of in Europe. So in Europe, the octane rating is 95. That's the minimum octane rating of their gasoline, okay? And it's much simpler, cheaper, whatever, for Suzuki or Toyota to get the European spec of that car and just bring it to Australia and not bother or not go to the expense of recalibrating that engine to, uh, co to cope with our 91, all right? So... I suspect that's what's happened with the case of uh, Suzuki Swift Sport and the other Suzuki with the turbocharged engine. See, Suzuki's got two turbocharged engines in the, in the Swift. It's a one-litre three-cylinder or a 1.4-litre four-cylinder, and they both demand 95 premium. And Toyota uh, offers the CHR with a four-cylinder 1.2-litre turbocharged engine, and it demands 95 as well. So... That's kind of a cheap assed way of getting the car here and getting the entry price as low as possible because they don't have to amortise the cost of retuning that engine over the uh, number of units that they hope to sell, which could add considerably to the price in the case of a low-volume car like the Swift, right? So there's all of that stuff to consider. So if I was you and I was looking for a new car, one of the things on my checklist would be what 
is the minimum octane rating of fuel that it requires, okay? And for a lot of people, you know, they make this choice to run their 91 compatible vehicle on 95 or 98, and that's absolutely fine. Okay, you can do that. It's a bit of a waste of money. The car's not going to go much better. It's not going to return much better economy either. It will go slightly better at wide open throttle against a balancing load and it will return slightly better economy, but not enough economy to compensate for the difference in the price of the fuel. Okay, it's a big mistake to do the other, though, because a few people who've made this mistake have gotten onto me by email and said, like, is it okay?" to run my car on uh, 91 if it specifies 95 and maybe it would be okay you know but I don't have a crystal ball on that and the danger is that at he- at high loads on a hot day like against a heavy balancing load overtaking uphill at high rpm on a hot day you can cause that fuel to detonate at the wrong time to burn at the wrong time in relation to the position of the piston and the crankshaft and that can lead to significant damage to the engine over time so if the manufacturer says 95 you've got to run it on 95 or you can run it on 98 but you can't run it on 91 or e10 that's just how this works and if you're listening in a place like North America, this is going to be very confusing indeed because you use a different rating system. See, we use this thing called the Research Octane Number and you guys use in North America, use this thing called the Anti-Knock Index, which is the average of the Research Octane Number and another test called the MON or Motor Octane Number Test. So it's just RON plus MON divided by 2 equals anti-knock index and that's what you use in America okay Uh, without getting too technical about it the RON and the MON are the same test they just occur at different engine speeds the RON is at don't quote me but 900 rpm and the MON test occurs at 600 rpm in a special test engine and there are these two controlled fuels one's called um, iso octane which is 224 trimethyl pentane if you want to be all chemistry lab about it and the other one is n heptane and the thing about iso-octane is it's got a research octane number of 100 and n-heptane has uh, a research octane number of zero. So if you, you, if you test a sample of fuel and it performs the same as a shandy of 95% iso-octane and 5% n-heptane, that fuel is 95 ron. That's how this works. And if you do the same test at a different engine speed, 600 instead of 900, It'll be whatever in the MON department. It gets very confusing for Australians if you're looking at a North American owner's manual, for example, online, because 87 anti-knock index is about the same as 91 RON. So if you're looking at a manual from America and it says, you know, 91 is okay, that means 91 anti-knock index. And that might be for something like, I don't know, a Jeep SRT or something. And if you go and use 91 RON, you're using a fuel with too low an octane number, okay? So that's just something to consider. And I guess the other case for premium unleaded that we need to examine is does it make your engine any cleaner? And frankly, I don't see an epidemic of dirty engines. Like I don't see an epidemic of dirty injectors, dirty combustion chambers, things of that nature. And don't forget that in a modern engine, you know, the fuel and the air only mix in the combustion chamber. So the fuel itself can't play any sort of role in cleaning the inlet manifold or the inlet tract generally because it just doesn't go there. The fuel is not there in the inlet port, okay? It can't do any cleaning there, so there's that to consider. But I would strongly urge you to make sure what the fuel spec for any car you're considering buying is just so that you know when you get to that very first uh, fuel stop that it's not just going to be the Groundhog Day of recurring nightmares about Jesus, I had no idea idea that this uh, car that I've just paid all of this money for and which I can't afford to take a bath on is going to require me spending all of this additional money on premium fuel that I had no friggin' idea that it needed. Because this, let's not forget, in a car like a Swift Sport or a CHR, they will put the fuel requirements, bury them in the specs, okay? So if you download the PDF for the specs, it'll be there. But it's not going to be in the glossy part of the website or the glossy part of the brochure because it's not seen as a net 
selling proposition. It's not going to get anyone across the line, the fact that cars of this nature need this expensive fuel. So if you are buying a car, I strongly urge you to look at things of this nature so that there is not a rude shock awaiting at the end of all of that. And I can see the sound meters actually working again, and I'm not getting any message about that. So I'm quite pleased that we've got audio now. Isn't that uplifting? With that burning issue out of the way, and no problems with the stream this time, at the risk of sounding like an un uncomfortable conversation with my urologist. We did have a problem with the stream last Thursday, inconveniently. So it doesn't appear to be happening. Nobody's telling me there's a problem with the stream. We might do some quick Q&A with you before I go. How's that? Our uh, Chisel, a favourite of mine. Good afternoon, John. G'day, viewers. That's very formal, Chis. Given the standard of message I sometimes see in the chat from you, well done. Turning a new leaf, son. Rob Wazza says, I do see that in Volkswagen direct injection engines. I don't know what that is, but presumably you mean that caked on gunk, mate. And yeah, that is a thing in modern engines. And it all depends on two things, that caked on atherosclerosis of the inlet port, that tends to be related to whether or not you get out on the highway a bit because it does purify your oil and get your engine into that lean burning mode. And the other thing is, of course, how well the engineers did their R&D, right? Because the PCV system needs to separate the oil droplets from the gases that it's recirculating into the engine. And if it does not do that effectively, then you're going to have oily residue going into your inlet. And you're also going to have EGR, like exhaust gas recirculation coming in. And the combination of those two things like hot exhaust gas and uh, PCV vapors when they mix in your inlet port if it gets beyond a certain level you will get that sort of baked on sludge which is a bit of a bastard over time if it builds up and that is a, a modern engine thing certainly with multi-point injection the injector was kind of just on top of the inlet valve back in the inlet port and it did tend to spray the powerful solvent of petrol or diesel or something all over the valves continuously on the way in so they didn't gunk up but certainly you know upstream of that the same problem pertained so there's definitely that to consider. It's not bad getting a mechanic to stick an inspection camera down the inlet port from time to time, say at 50,000 Ks or something, just to see how your engine's going and uh, just to get some picture on whether or not uh, some sort of fix is required before it gets really serious and you need to pull things apart. There are you know, cleaning products that they can spray in and just let soak around and then drive around the block to blow them all out. And that tends not to do such a bad job, frankly, if you catch it early like so many other things. So, difficult nerd. I'm very sorry your parents called you that. That explained a lot. It says, I'm outraged, John. You recommended the Subaru Outback a couple of years ago. I bought one and it works flawlessly. It doesn't annoy me and now I have nothing to complain about. <laughs> yes, I know. There are some people who just aren't happy unless they're outraged. I interact with many of them in the comments feed on YouTube from time to time. And hey, if that's you and you'd like to be outraged... I'm overjoyed to be of service in that department and I still sleep like a baby as a result. But it is a curious thing, isn't it, in the modern world, this sort of entitlement to express outrage, to, to sort of, um, if you're offended, it's almost as if the world needs to know. And not only that, they need to apologise and then make some sort of repatriation. I'm not seeing it because, you know, offence is different to falling off a ladder, right? If you fall off a ladder, you can break your friggin' neck or get a brain injury. And if you're offended, that's as bad as it gets. Like, nothing else happens. Just, if it launches you on a journey of personal inquiry, just to see, you know, how how well, how justified your beliefs were, why they were offended by some nut on YouTube like me who challenged them, okay? If you believe and you know that there's a solid logical basis for belief in whatever and someone challenges you, that's kind of trivial, isn't it? If you're offended, there must be a basis for that offense and you might want to drill down into that because it might be that your beliefs are bullshit, just saying. You know, that, that's kind of how this works, certainly. So anyway, thanks for that, difficult nerd. I do appreciate you being annoyed that you haven't had a problem with a vehicle that I recommended. There's a circular logic to that that I really do enjoy. Dan Wallace is here. 
He says, indignantly, I king work making me miss the start of the live feed. Well, you didn't miss too much, Dan, because at 2.30 when I had planned to go live, mate, I had no friggin' audio. And uh, that's because I decided to outsmart myself with a slightly different setup. And without monitoring it first in the cans, you've got no idea that there's no audio. So I talked to myself, but you got to see me do that for about 10 minutes, so... Yes. Ah, such a professional. That's good, isn't it? Biggles1024 says, sleep like a baby. I know where we're going with this. You mean you wet the bed and woke up crying? Yeah, yeah. And I was wearing a sheet and it was full of poop and uh, made me feel just like the olden days. Dude, that's disgusting. I'm outraged. I get that, Biggles. You're outraged too. So I'm happy to have been of service there too, mate. Uh, Crackpot says, I don't even know what that means. It's all just gibberish. Now, uh, who else have we got here in the chat who might be making a valuable contribution? David Bow, not David Bowie, but David Bow, says, Why does my wife's Polo GTI feel faster than my Golf R? I know it's not quicker. Is it the size of car or front-wheel drive versus all-wheel drive? It might just be, be because it's kind of smaller and a bit tinnier and it doesn't have as much insulation from NVH and doesn't feel quite as raucous but they'll both feel equally fast when they shit themselves in due course and spend three months in the dealership so that'll be an equalizing effect of sorts I, I, I hope this doesn't happen to you but it does happen far too often to products of that nature so there's that now Tony S says reckon we have hit a high point motor longevity all downhill from here diesel or petrol I love that. It's almost English. I think we've always hit the high point for motoring, right? Because I look back over <laughs> three friggin' decades of doing this, and there have been times when I've looked at particular cars and gone, dude, that's awesome. And then through the prism of you know retrospectivity, the rose-coloured glasses into the rear vision mirror, those cars are kind of, yeah, okay now, but... It's like Chuck Yeager said once I went to a lecture of his, got to ask him a question right at the end, which was quite uplifting, being such a hero of mine, you know. I, I asked him about flying a Mustang in World War II where he became an ace and a, a Mustang was one of those you know, classic fighter aircraft, right? I said, y you must lust after every chance to get back in a Mustang. And he said, son, it's just like cars. The best one is always the newest one. So... I don't think we've hit uh, a high point like we're not certainly at the crest. We're still just going up the rise and every point is a high point for automotive development. You drive an old car, drive a 20-year-old car. It, it's a piece of shit in comparison to a, a car that fills the same niche today. It just is. Uh, so it's okay to romanticise these cars, but to think that they were objectively better is just nuts. You know, you can love them if they're old, but you can't make the case that they're better. That just, that's nuts. It doesn't exist. Uh, petrol or diesel? Well, that just kind of depends on what you want, you know. Diesel is more fuel efficient. It's going to cost you a bit more up front. If you have a catastrophic failure, it's going to be freaking expensive as opposed to just expensive with a petrol car. And diesels do, of course, make more power at lower RPM, so they're ideal for things like towing. But they do have particle filters, and most of those demand regular highway driving. So if you're not getting out on the highway once a fortnight for 45 minutes to an hour, you might want to rethink the attractiveness of diesel. But certainly if you're going to tow anything heavier than you know basic box trailer, then diesel is a real plus. And they do just lope along and feel effortless. You know, compared with a two, two, two and a bit litre diesel, per turbocharged modern direct injected diesel, feels much better generally to drive normally in traffic than a three and a half litre petrol v6 okay from the same sort with the same tech essentially atmo v6 and basically in an overtaking or drag racing context the v6 is probably going to win but for normal driving the diesel is just going to feel better and you'll only have to go to the filling station like uh, two-thirds as often in the diesel as well so that's kind of nice now Ken Masters says, hi, John, we tried to get a price on a Forester and four dealers later. The best we got was 3% discount. They wouldn't go lower than the next model down. A Subaru too popular, bad time to shop around, question mark, all of that stuff. Look, Ken, it's like this, mate. There are two factors. 
there's supply and demand. And at the moment, in many niches, demand exceeds supply because COVID-19 has affected production capacity and there are long waiting lists for some models. And I'm not sure if Forrester is one of those. But if you kind of go to the dealer in general, regardless of the supply and demand situation here and you kind of ask them what's the best price you can do on this or what kind of discount can you offer me on this the dealer's an ambush predator he does this all day long he's not going to fall all over himself and go well here's a billion dollars off He's going to give you the smallest token amount and give you some excuse. Like he's going to say, in this case, he's going to say, well, Subaru won't let us discount or, you know, there's a company policy at the moment, you know, COVID-19 has affected us like this and we can only give you 3% or, you know, we can't go lower than the, be- the next model down because that'll affect whatever. And it'll all sound quite plausible because they are weapons grade bullshitters. So here's what you do, okay? If it's 45000 bucks drive away and you need to do this research before you go to the dealer dude okay if that car is 45 grand drive away what you do is you go there and you go through the bullshit and you go for the test drive and you go yeah okay i really like this car i want it you've got one here it's silver i really like it i'll take that one my missus my girlfriend my boyfriend whomever my soccer coach (laughs) is going to cut my nuts, Santa Claus, is going to cut my nuts off if I spend one cent more than 40 grand, okay? So I'm here, here's my pen, I'm ready to sign as long as you can make the price add up for me. And 40 grand, dude, it's only a little bit more than 10% off, you can come down that low, ready to sign now. And whatever he says after that, if it's not, yeah, sure, sign here, whatever he says after that, just look up at the clock on the wall, check, it's bullshit o'clock. And whatever he's saying, just hear this. La 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 like that. And you go, Well, I'm terribly sorry, we can't do business. I'm still good to spend forty grand on the car. How about you go and mention that to the sales manager and I'll go for a walk up the road, I'll want to have a look at Mazda and I'll take a look at Toyota as well and see what they can do for me. And if I'm still in the market this afternoon, just give us a call back. In fact, give us a call back in 10 or 15 minutes if you're still interested, but I can't go one cent higher than 40 grand. And if that doesn't work, if the price doesn't come down to under 40 grand, then they really can't come down below that. But if you put them under pressure like that, this is one of the most powerful things you can do, right? It's just such a powerful negotiating position to walk away from the deal but remain amenable to them coming good with your offer right so if they come good and they go 40 we can't let 40 grand walk out the door jesus you know that you might be amazed how malleable the price becomes and if it doesn't become malleable then hey you're just asking the world and that often happens when people are unaware that the price is already massively discounted like if the importer's gutsing themselves and they're backhanding the dealer with an incentive to guts himself then there's no more discounting okay that it just doesn't work that way cars are a commercial product and Once you get below this point where it just doesn't work, then they can't afford to sell it to you like that, okay? So if you're asking for a discount, you're always going to walk out with your your ankles in your hands, which is always undignified. If you're telling them what the price you're prepared to pay is, that's going to work. And if it doesn't work, there's a solid reason why it doesn't. And you just have to be a bit of a bastard, okay? You've got to kind of put all of the conversational niceties and diplomacy and things of that nature just put them over there you don't have to be impolite or rude you don't have to you don't have to be too much of a bastard but you don't have to appease people in the way that you have to appease the boss and the hr manager at work or everyone else that you live with from time to time okay you're dealing with somebody in sales you're only talking about money it's a commercial transaction that's how i would approach that every frigging time if I was doing it myself, right? Ash C now, he says, I've always had big Aussie sixes. What is something I could buy used at about 20 grand that has decent performance, cost of ownership? I was considering something like an Elantra SR Turbo or a Veloster Turbo. Not such a fan of the Veloster, frankly, but Elantra SR Turbo, quite all right. Um, 
Hyundai i30 N line, Kia Cerato GT, any sort of 20,000 buck WRX that hasn't been thrashed. I'd want to get something like, I don't know, a 2015 WRX premium CVT that's been some managing director's car, you know, someone with vestigial responsibility who hasn't just done, you know, endless track days and killed the brakes 57 times, right? Some sort of business dude's WRX, I'd be buying that. That'd be a nice car. Uh, you could also look for a generation, like the original Stinger, like the first of the Stingers would be coming onto the market. Now, I don't know if you'd get one as low as 20 grand, though, probably not. Uh, cars of that nature, you know, there's even Mazda SP25, uh, a Mazda SP25 Astina could be okay. They're pretty responsive to drive as well. It's a big Atmo engine, so not turbo, but still goes pretty well and is pretty balanced, you know. You could look at, um, what else? You could you could maybe look at a Mazda 6 as well with the same 2.5 litre engine if you want the slightly bigger platform. They tend to be quite responsive. It depends how much you value punch and how much you value finesse. If you value the punch... Anything with 1.6 plus litres and a turbo is going to be okay. Hyundai and Kia do an excellent uh, chassis tuning job as well for Australian conditions. So the dynamics tend to be quite rewarding and quite well matched to the nature of that uh, that performance. So there's that. We'll do another few Q&As if you like because this seems to be going okay. Stream hasn't fallen apart. I'm still squeezing it out, as it were. Isn't that nice? Jason Mazarol now says... Called, oh, this doesn't sound good. This sounds like it could be negative. I don't mind a negative one. Called auto expert for a quote for a carnival with, uh, where is he? Where is he? Where are you? I hate it when it jumps around. With a quote for a carnival with one in hand, was told by your mob that the price we had was a better deal due to special circumstances. Thanks. Great and honest service without BS. Isn't that amazing? See, when I normally get that kind of thing, is uh, it normally ends with, how the F were you unable to do a better job were you, than me? Like, that's unacceptable kind of thing. Jason, what you saw is what you get, mate. If we can't do a better deal for you, we just tell you. And quite often, there, there could be a car in a dealership which for a variety of reasons like they're really desperate to get rid of it because they need to make their sales quota or it's the last model year 20 in the country and the price had gone up for model year 21 or something of that nature if that's the case we just can't do it you know we're not magicians you know so if that's the case, we just tell you and move on. If you've got that bird in the hand, that's unbeatable. We'll just tell you to go for it because there's no point bullshitting you about it. What are we going to do? Hold you up for three weeks and go, oh, mate, sorry, we can't beat the price. That That's just nuts. It's quite uh, a common occurrence. It doesn't happen all the time, but once or twice a week, I'll get someone communicate with me and say, you were unable to save me thousands. I was able to get $28,000 for this car and you were only able to offer me 27750 What the... That's often because the driveway price is like 35 grand, dude. You know, you've already got a fantastic deal. You, and if you've got a fantastic deal... Get the ink dry on the contract because it could evaporate at any time. There's that about it as well. Ben Wintle now says, thanks for all your great advice. My pleasure, Ben. Thanks for being part of the live stream, mate. It's uh, not much point doing it without you out there listening. and <laughs> Certainly not much point doing it when I've got the fader on microphone one down to zero either, you know, because I'm clearing my throat just before I go live. But we can edit that out. So anyway, Ben goes... Uh, I'm looking to buying a new Ranger or D-Max and your advice has already helped me in a great deal. Well, that's great, Ben. I'm, I'm glad, mate. I'm not so sure the new D-Max is a place I would go just yet. I've heard that there are extremely long waiting lists to supply that car and I would also want to be absolutely certain that they've done the hair and makeup properly in R&D and a few months on the road let other people be the guinea pigs there 
that'd be okay. I mean, range is a done deal. You know what you're going to get. That 3.2 litre five cylinder diesel is pretty strong. You know, the power the powertrain's okay. I think all of the um, reports about failures of the transmission there, I think that's a little bit overblown in the market. And I'm not sure what the circumstances were for the few failures that did occur. But I think range is quite robust at the moment. And, you know, if you take your vehicle off road and you retune the engine and you abuse the shit out of it, then if the transmission dies, it, it's hardly the transmission's fault, I'd suggest. Or you tow a four-ton caravan when the limit is kind of three and a half and a prudent limit would be two and a half to three. So there's there's that to consider as well, right? So I'm not so sure about the two-litre twin turbo Ranger with the 10-speed. I do believe that that hunts quite a bit if you tow heavy with it. And also because it's a bi-turbo, it tends only to perform better than the 3.2 when you wind it right up. So there's that to consider as well. Uh, Aphrodite. Aphrodite is a regular in the comments generally, but this is the first Aphrodite chat I've had live. So Aphrodite says, greetings from, from Kanukistan. Thank you for listening all the way up there. What time is it in Kanukistan? Anyway, actually bought a Kona EV based in part on your review. At least here, the grid is very low carbon, so it actually is a strong eco solution. Love the channel. Well, thank you very much, Aphrodite. And I'd have to say that I love driving the Kona EV that I've got on long-term test at the moment. I especially love not going to the friggin' petrol station, you know, because <laughs> nostalgia factor there, zero. There's nothing enjoyable about filling a vehicle up with fuel. You only do it so that your vehicle is not roadside furniture in the next 20 to 100 Ks, right? That's why you refuel. And that's why the process doesn't have to be glamorous or enjoyable. There's no neck rub when you go and buy fuel. It's all hateful, okay? Because they got you over a barrel. It's like buy fuel or stop in the middle of the road for eternity like that so anyway nice to hear from you aphrodite and thank you for listening all the way up there in kanukistan i've always wanted to go to kanukistan i've actually been to windsor in canada for like 45 minutes you know i i was told that they had better strip clubs there i got advice from a dude in port in ford's pr department he said are you are you gents going for what's the effect of are you gents going for some male entertainment <laughs> this evening and we went maybe and he said well if you do definitely go over the border to canada because the caliber of a strip club and he went into the reasons but which i won't detail here but he said far better strip clubs in windsor and he was right i'd have to say so good advice from ford's pr dude in that case and i don't get to say that very often either now let us let us move on nexus 9 says hi john do you think the new Genesis GV80 and G70 are going to be enough to get Genesis some proper growing market share in Australia? Yeah, I think it'll be part of the solution, but the main part of the solution for Genesis in Australia is time. Like, look at Lexus, okay? I've got the figures here, incidentally. Um, I think I had, well, I, I did have the figures. I've got them in front of me here in this PDF. Like, um, Lexus year-to-date sales, okay, uh, 6,636 units in Australia. That's until, that's for the 10 months ending in October, all right? Now, if I look at uh, BMW, 18,855, Mercedes, 23,667. So BMW sales, roughly three times Lexus sales. Mercedes sales, roughly four times Lexus sales. Audi sales, 12,313 over 10 months. So roughly double Lexus sales. And how long's Lexus been here? 20-something years. Nearly 30, I guess, if I had to guess. Billions of dollars worth of investment to be one half of Audi, one third of BMW, one quarter of Mercedes-Benz. Uh, Genesis has been here for a little while, but it's only been a toe-in-the-water exercise. It's only been its own brand for a tiny amount of time. Frankly, the, the, I've driven the GV80. I drove it uh, about a week ago now. I think it was Wednesday of last week, but I only got to drive it for about 15 kilometres. I drove the 3.5 twin-turbo version. Very nice indeed. Not the top spec. Pretty comfortable, very chunky wheel. It, it felt like a luxury SUV, which is to say it didn't ride real harsh like a BMW X5M or something. It didn't crash over bumps. It wasn't wallowy. It was just 
Goldilocks tune for luxury, right? And the engine and automatic transmission, the powertrain was up to getting you around, loping along. It got it got up and uh, and and went reasonably well when you when you expected it to go fast. It went fast enough without you know ripping your head off. So all up, it was just a, a nice-ish proposition. It certainly fits into the luxury space. I'd put it up against an X5 that costs twenty grand more. And just see how you felt about that. That'd be interesting. Um, The main solution for Genesis getting market share is going to be time. It's going to be decent products with time. Now, uh, the G70 is essentially just like uh, luxury stinger. You know what I mean? So sporty, luxury, stinger-esque thing. It's going to be okay as well, but that's not going to be enough to get Genesis to critical mass by the end of this year or by the end of next year. It's going to take 10 years until they're doing reasonably well. It's probably going to take a decade until they make money, and then it's probably going to take another decade to take the fight to Lexus, BMW, Audi, and Mercedes-Benz because you're just going to have to get people away from those brands and these are people who are going to have to be prepared to spend 70 80 90 100 110 thousand dollars on a brand that doesn't have very much traction in the marketplace but promises to be okay so that's kind of where that's as nice as i can be about genesis you know if you buy it now if you buy a genesis today you'll probably get a very nice car and it's kind of also a mad experiment in how quickly that brand can evolve and cut through into the market to challenge the established four or the established three and a half. Because let's face it, Lexus is at best half a challenger and it's taken 20 something years to get it there. So it's a pretty hard road to hoe, but I'd suggest that HMG does have the funds to play that long-term game and turn it into a winner. They've just got to stay the course, right? And that means they're going to have to be consistent in the boardroom. And when you look at events that happen outside one's control, like, for example, the global financial crisis and its effect on this and that in the car industry, anything can happen to Genesis, right? But at the moment, it's looking good. And it's very easy for them to double, triple, quadruple their sales and issue all kinds of releases like that in the future because they're operating on such a uh, small base at the moment. So uh, just do a few more of these if you're happy to keep going. I've got plenty of time, more or less. Uh, Adam Smith now, he says, if you've bought a brand new Volvo, <laughs> shitbox, you were right, and it, proves you, um, and it proves to be problematic in the first year, at which point do you admit defeat and buy something more sensible? Adam, what I'd do is, now Volvo is renowned at being poor at customer service in Australia, okay? So if you you are in that position, you've got to forget about the warranty and you've got to remember all about consumer law. And if you don't know all about consumer law, then what you have to do, what you must do, absolutely, is educate yourself, all right? Because if your vehicle has a major problem, you are entitled to a refund or a replacement and you get to choose. That's how the legislation is written. The definition of major problem is not specified, okay, in the legislation, but it's, that means it can be debated in a consumer law tribunal, right? But if you are over that threshold, and clearly over that threshold, a one-hour discussion with your solicitor will tell you if you're in that position, and that would not be an admission of defeat, that would be the reason to go to war, okay? Because I'd want all of my money back. I wouldn't want to take a bath, all right? If you've had a series of rolling minor problems, that might also constitute a major problem under the legislation, and you might be in line for that refund or replacement. The details are really going to matter there, so the conversation with your solicitor is going to be critical. And if you've just had a running series of problems, then and they're minor problems, but they just shit you because Volvo's quality control is often crap. And this is just unfortunate. If you own a Volvo and you love your Volvo and it hasn't given you a problem, then I'd like to say I'm sorry for saying this, but frankly, I'm not. You know, my heart goes out to the people like Adam here who are affected by these kinds of problems. You know, what you've got to do is advocate for your own self-interest. So, 
you know, get the dealer to fix the friggin' thing. And if they're not prepared to fix it, get head office to provide technical support to the dealer. Because one of the things about these small uh, brands like Volvo, I mean, look at Volvo, right? I'll just have a look at Volvo car. They've sold 5,994 cars in the first 10 months. So 6,000. Toyota has sold 158,000 cars. Hyundai sold 51,000 cars. Mazda sold 68,000 cars. You know, even MG, Chinese MG, has sold 11,308 cars. Volvo's been here forever, and the best they can do is 6,000. Like, come on, they're nowhere. They've been nowhere for decades. They're going to be nowhere in a decade. Volvo, we're nowhere, okay? And this means that there's not a tremendous amount of investment onshore in relation to things like technical training and support, okay? And this is the tightrope you're in. So if you've just got the shits with your car, it's presented with numerous small problems, not enough to qualify as a major problem, you might take a bath on it. But once a lemon, always a lemon. And you can't expect miraculously the vehicle not to be a lemon in another 12 months. You have to ask yourself, am I just experiencing pain here to teach me a powerful lesson? And I think I've learnt it now and I've experienced enough pain. Get me out of here. And the one thing I would say about this, okay, is that used car prices are stratospheric at the moment. So if you take a bath selling your Volvo now, even if it's only like, I don't know, 12 months old, then it's not going to be as big a bath as it will be in 18 months' time. And it's not as big a bath as it would have been had you been in this position two years ago. So there's that. So... You've got to call it as you see it based on the circumstances, but weigh it up like that, mate. At least that's how I do it. And I'm very sorry to hear that you are in that position. People people often think that buying a brand like Volvo, okay, is an example of buying something that truly is premium. And they infer that that means they will be treated in a premium way in the service department. And that means that the reliability will be somehow better than a mainstream car. And the reality could be no different, right? These things are just not true, okay? Mainstream cars are built in huge volumes. They've got more to spend on R&D. There's often a great many more resources devoted to the development, you know. And the service experience from uh, Hyundai, Suzuki, even Mazda, Toyota, Lexus, brands like this. Lexus is just like Toyota luxury, right? Kia. Those brands treat their customers very well, in my experience. And I've had so many complaints from the likes of Volvo and Fiat Chrysler and brands of that nature. In relation to the number of vehicles sold, the problems and the poor support is off the chart. Okay, so this is the dice you roll when you go out and you buy a brand such as that. Now, I'll just do another couple of these because we're getting some good questions through and I don't want to leave too many people in the lurch here. The Mandalorian says, there is a group of Aussies that are looking to get a $19,990 drive-away EV sedan with 105 kilometres of range on the road, either via university and crowdfunding route, or they might lobby Toyota Mazda MG to make. And what I'd say there, okay, is that there's... A thousand good ideas like this, okay? Mr. Dyson had one about getting an EV off the ground, and he didn't need crowdfunding or a university, right? And he's already building battery this and battery that. And he couldn't do it, okay? So I'd suggest that I've seen all these good ideas, good homegrown supercar ideas, and good homegrown EV ideas, and good, you know, EV conversion kits, like you can buy an electric bike conversion kit, right? You can turn your Treadley into an electric bike by buying a conversion kit, a battery, a motor, the pedal sensor, whatever, little display with mode buttons on it, whatever. You can buy that, okay? Why can't you do that for a car? I don't get that. Why can't you do that on a shitbox gets, right? Shitbox gets donor vehicle, turn it into a friggin' EV. They've already invested all of the CO2 into building the shell, okay? Why can you not just replace the internal combustion engine with a front drive battery 
integrated whatever motor unit with a generator and an inverter as a block that just bolts in. I don't know why nobody's doing that, frankly. I really don't. I don't know if that's a regulatory thing, whether they'd have to recertify it, whether it would no longer comply with ADRs. I'm not sure. But certainly from a green perspective, using a late-ish model, say 10-year-old car as a donor, would be extremely green. And surely it's viable to me at least. But the car industry doesn't do this at all, right? They don't even upgrade existing products. It's because they're obsessed with selling you something new. It's always like Apple doesn't do it either with iPhones. It's not upgrade your iPhone 9. It's buy the iPhone 12 Pro Max, whatever, you know? It's got to be that. Otherwise, they go out the back door. It's always buy the next big thing. And my take on all of these green EV type uh, concepts is is that we cannot consume our way to a greener future. If the green thing is something that motivates you, then buying an EV is kind of indefensible when you look at the life cycle analysis. But And yet, every second web page from car makers about you know, battery-powered cars talks about them being green. It doesn't talk about air pollution in our cities, which is a major consideration. It doesn't talk about energy security for the nation, which is also major. These are the two reasons why I really like EVs as a concept. And they're okay to drive, you know, they're okay. They're not as good as a similar priced petrol car, right? Like I'd have more fun buying a, the right $70,000 petrol car than I would driving a Kona EV. But a Kona EV is nice to drive and it doesn't pollute the city and it helps with energy security for the nation. So there's that. Uh, one more, I think. Let's do Motoring Box. Motoring Box says, I agree. I'm not sure what with at the moment. Let's find out. I agree. Imagine a kit designed to bolt up to popular car models. Obvious choice, Toyota Corolla or Yaris. There's so many on the road. Easy to find a donor. You know, spin the motor at 750 RPM for idle and the rest of the car should function as usual. Yeah, there, there's a lot of merit in the EV conversion kit. If you can get the component parts right and train up the installers so that we don't have, like, cars catching fire all over town because that would be a thing you know the batteries do store rather a lot of energy not a lot of energy in comparison to a tank full of liquid fuel but still more than enough to hurt yourself or somebody else so there's that we need to make them crash worthy we need to make them durable they'd need a cooling system that bol bolted up but hey the donor vehicle's already got a radiator am i right so it needs a computer to control all of this stuff and you need to rip out all of the ICE stuff and then just bolt in a conversion kit. And to me, that just doesn't seem that difficult. Maybe I'm missing something. I'm not sure. Um, ATX CVPI, which is an interesting name, says, Rich Rebuilds is converting the least reliable used car to electric. I'm talking about the dreaded Mini Cooper S 1.6 supercharged. It's a DC motor setup. See, this is interesting. I'd love to see a conversion kit get traction. Because if you could spend... I don't know, five to 10 grand on a conversion kit and five to 10 grand on a donor car, that's looking pretty viable. And it, it's not looking too cheap assed either, frankly. So love to know what you think about all of that. Now, I got to go because it's nearly 3.30. Sorry about botching the first bit of that preemptive live stream roughly an hour ago. How amateur of me. Oops, a daisy. Now, do join me tomorrow night at 8.30 Sydney time when we'll do Q&A with you for an hour. I promise to have the sound up. I'm going to get a piece of fluoro gaffer tape right now. And henceforth, I will check the audio like a proper seasoned media professional when I initially go live. So anyway, that's one of the cool things about you know, streaming live on YouTube, right? Warts and all. And if you fuck it up, hey, you got to own it. And I certainly did that at the commencement of that earlier one. Heart on my sleeve. Sorry about that. Sorry if that mucked you around. Didn't mean to do it. I'm only human, sometimes even less. I'll see you tomorrow night at 8.30. Thanks for joining me.